Chapter Five of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Blue Eyed Maid. The inn at Slumberwell was called the Blue Eyed Maid. This was my first discovery on waking in the morning, for there she hung just outside my window gently swaying herself in the sunshine and staring into the room with the bluest and boldest pair of eyes that paint could give her beyond this stony-faced inquisitive damsel lay the village green every blade of grass beaded with the raindrops of the night before and round the green little thatched cottages huddled side by side each with its patch of bright-hued garden glowing before it. Slumberwell lay low, and was as near waterlogged as a place could be. The river all but overflowed its reedy banks, and made so many loops and sharp bends here as almost to enclose the village. You came upon unsuspected brooks and freshets at every turn of the street the sound of running water was eternally in your ears to get out of slumberwell dry shod seemed almost an impossibility but by help of some well-worn stepping-stones i escaped from its drenched shady precincts at last and won out into the untrammelled sunlight of the hills at the first hilltop i turned for a final glimpse of the little place there was nothing to be seen of it but a plume of blue wood smoke here and there and a slender white spire standing up amidst towering elms all green as in their summer prime in the deep wood afar off i heard the stroke of an axe the river sent up a rippling bell-like note and now as i paused listening the church clock struck clear and low the most solemn and beautiful sound i had ever heard but saving this there might have been no human settlement for a hundred miles round me so wild and quiet was the place and yet there was no element of solitude in the morning certainly none of that stagnant inactivity and out of the worldliness inseparable from many scenes far busier than this what actually constitutes solitude and desolation seems never to have been rightly determined it is not absence of human life enterprise these as often as not carry the very spirit of loneliness and effacement into the noisiest street it is difficult to analyse even the simplest of our emotions so many crosswinds and undercurrents go to sway the mood of the moment that we soon lose all knowledge of the course we have mentally steered but perhaps the secret lies outside our own personalities altogether the old astrologers believed that the trend of human life was ordered by the stars he that was wise enough might read the whole tale of human destiny writ in their bright calligraphy but like all absurdities this may have had a certain element of truth at its core whether other planets have their influence on our daily doings and sensations or not it is certain that our own round earth does strangely overrule us at times both in heart and mind coming away from slumberwell on that silent blue and gold morning the fact or fancy call it what you will that nature was still in her wide awake strenuous mood of the night before was borne in upon me at every step a dead calm brooded everywhere the sunbeams poured steadily down on a landscape that was all smiling peace and quietude bees hummed in the wayside blossoms 
and the birds kept up a cheery optimistic chorus far and near in the woods but the sky held none of this tranquillity it was more like a battlefield strewn with the wreck and violence of the night where scattered and beaten the old feud still smouldered fiercely this sense of a living strife between stormy night and overmastering morning sunshine of a sort of rearguard action still contested sullenly bitterly between the victors and the retiring host found a curious echo within me for all the glad light and song and fragrance of the morning i was conscious of being thoroughly ill at ease it was as if the war-sated earth were crying peace peace when there was no peace though the sun was irresistibly cleaving a path before him the sky was full of cloud forms of a livid ominous hue stark upon the azure or laid on with a bizarre touch and ruthless strength one upon the other every depth and intensity of grey was there twisted torn rags of mist were caught in the hollows of the black downs behind them a glowering rampart of inky cloud made another horizon just as solid as the hills yet it was not the thunder charge character the declared vehemence and velocity of the sky that so strangely moved me it was the fact that all the clouds still retained their careering minatory look though utterly spent and driven to a standstill i struck a match and held it up in the sunshine without a tremor the flame went straight up into the lifeless air a thread of gossamer would not have swayed its own breadth in that surpassing stillness amidst the blossoms at my feet a butterfly dallied i looked from the butterfly to the sky above her gently fluttering veins held more real motion than the whole silent serried heaven vast black cumulus and lurid streamer ragged peak beyond peak tumbling together in panic-stricken rout it was all petrified into a sombre an almost horrifying stillness that gave the lie to the placid sunshine and the dreamy quiet of meadow and song-haunted wood it was but my third day on the road but even thus early i had got into the settled habit of keeping an ear trained behind me for any sound of overtaking wheels this time i heard the sound a mile away i heard the horse drop from a smart trot to walking pace at the first hill heard it pick up again on the level and heard its steady slow tramp up the second and steeper rise there was no mistaking the vehicle nor the type of man that presently came into view it was a doctor's gig and in it a doctor of the good old-fashioned type well-groomed rosy-faced important and a look about him that instantly suggested the whist-lover and the judge of wine i can only take you a mile or so on the road he said when we were bowling along together my path to-day lies through the wilds i am taking to the heather almost immediately this had a promising ring about it i told him that any way was my way if he would consent to put up with my company he laughed a rich quiet restrained laugh like a chord on an old violoncello there is not much company in a country doctor's daily life he said and it is only a chance that i am able to enjoy yours this morning as a rule wheels cannot take me where i have to go and there is nothing for it but to ride i thought to myself 
it would need a good horse to carry a man of his generous calibre he went on as though i had spoken the words aloud yes my riding days are pretty well over as you can see but there is no help for it this parish alone covers ten thousand acres and the few hundred people in it are scattered about in the most inaccessible places the poor man i am going to see to-day for instance though he is pretty well past all doctoring ah here's the gate now i am afraid i must take you by a rough road we turned into a sort of bridle path that was little else than two deep ruts in the virgin carpet of the wood the bushes clutched at our wheels and the overhanging branches lashed our faces as we went along then the track doubled up through a thicket of firs dark as night and finally out into the sunshine again where there lay before us a wide expanse of heathland studded with gorse and stunted pine a score of grassy tracks led away through the tangle of firs and bracken and heather each as well or as ill-defined as the rest my doctor chose his path unhesitatingly it was one of the pleasantest lifts that fell to my lot that day we went straight over the undulating heath right in the eye of the sun neither wheels nor hooves made the slightest sound in the soft springy turf we seemed to float along through the sunshine and sweet pure air of the november morning the sky was clearing fast under the hot sunbeams and getting with every moment into truer concord with the gladness of earth and my old unrest of heart was clearing with it we made such noiseless progress that even the rabbits were taken unawares often they scuttled out of the way only just in time to avoid the horse's hooves the birds sang on unconcernedly taking no sort of notice of us we moved in an arcade of music thrushes robins wrens were blithe in every thicket a flock of goldfinches scattered the thistle down in one place and in the next a whole company of linnets filled the air with their slender tweeting song a green woodpecker got up and laboured heavily off his crimson cap and emerald jerkin looking strangely tawdry and theatrical in the brilliant light and presently an old jack hare sprang into the path took one swift look at us then went limping away before us for half a mile or more carefully regulating his pace to ours the bluff old doctor pointed his whip towards a farmhouse that had now crept into view there is my place of call said he and that i am afraid will be the end of our journey together as i turn back when i have seen my man he left me at the first gate of the farm and drove up to the house alone and a few minutes after i saw him going off by a short cut to the heath through another field i watched him until he had disappeared into the wilderness of yellow gorse then went up to the house intent on my own business i had no idea of my whereabouts there was not a vestige of a road nor any other house in sight it struck me therefore as prudent to get some sort of general direction from the people there while there were people to ask i had resigned myself to the conviction that the ride over the heath was to be the sole bit of colour i was to obtain from the doctor for this my peripatetic kaleidoscope but indirectly he brought me now one of the queerest chips in the whole collection 
it was the farmer's wife who opened the door to my knock she was tall and slim and ceremoniously affable a mere word on the doorstep was obviously dead against her ideas of courtesy to strangers nothing would satisfy her but that i must come in and sit down the door opened direct into the kitchen it was a vast cavernous place with a stone floor and a ceiling crossed by many beams of smoke blackened oak from these depended strings of onions bunches of dried herbs sides of bacon and the like a huge wood fire hissed and crackled in the grate and tucked away in the ingle nook sat a gaunt wax visaged man wrapped in a blanket and spreading lean shaking hands to the blaze he took no notice whatever of my entry while the woman plunged into a complicated recital as to footpaths crossroads odd turnings that i was to take or avoid on my way the dying man for his life was plainly at its last flicker kept his wan eyes on the fire smiling vacuously his white attenuated fingers for ever wavering to and fro in the red light before him then ye goes by collops corner and soon as ye comes to three old ash trees you'll see a bit of a sandy lane don't go down there but take eliza it was the invalid's voice feebly hailing her take the next turn and to the right and what is now willem and then you keeps on straight as ever Lisa, mind as you don't forget to ask the barnbridge folk and old mrs stabber i'll see to it willem you keeps on straight as ever two feet'll carry ye fur as marcus's farm you'll know it by the green gables and then i had just thought o Lisa the smitherers ought to be asted too and george taylor has said as he'd follow me if i ain't followed he already willem do bide quiet and then ye'll see the road to staple fitzpain right afore your eyes tis far more belike but the thin high voice from the fireside twanged out again Lisa i likes the idea o gone but not forgotten at bein no so lonesome like as safe in eternity i never realised until that trying moment by how thin a line the pathetic and the comical are sundered in most human affairs End of chapter five Chapter Six of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tickner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Harmonious Ragman. When I got away from the house at last, my head was full of a confusion of local names, in which only one stood out clearly: Staple Fitzpain. It had an antiquated feudal sound and i remembered that my way to it lay past collops corner a little steady going brought me out into a winding green track between hedgerows which evidently led somewhere and i pushed on the day had changed during my sojourn in the farmhouse the calm had broken as though the breeze had been suddenly let out of leash in the treetops its voice was like the laughter of children pouring out of school it stemmed by me now in a glad frolic of liberty i could think of it only as the free child racing merrily homeward throwing cap in air for the very joy and i was carried irresistibly along with it catching the spirit of its mood as i went there was another happy wayfarer not far off as it proved and i came full upon him at collops corner 
he sat by the lane side making clothes pegs the green turf around him strewn with white chips of wood close by a dilapidated pony cart reared its shafts to the sky and a little farther off the pony itself was contentedly browsing the man wore a velveteen coat and a red neckcloth and as he worked he sang an old love ditty disjointedly full of absent-minded pauses as though clothes peg making were the most exacting occupation in the world the music stopped as i came up it ceased in a gurgling strangled way due to the fact that the man had at that moment clapped a handful of tacks into his mouth at his elbow lay a little heap of old treacle and tomato tins which he fell to cutting up into narrow strips he brought the two halves of each peg together fitted them with a tin band disgorged a tack and drove it into place with a single blow of an old horseshoe he worked at an incredible pace the heaps of cut wood and strips of tin diminished and the pile of finished pegs grew like magic as i watched him for half an hour perhaps we remained thus in perfect though mute good fellowship until the last tack was regurgitated and the last peg made and then the man got to his feet smiling and stretching himself twenty dozen said he looking down on his work twenty-three halfpences is half a crown that is when you've sold em then there's rabbit skins and bottles bottles is worth doin now there's a exchange over taunton way but this ain't a picnic country and it ain't the season tis props and pegs and brooms till come april and then be skeps for a month or two and that's how the poor lives says you i had said nothing of the kind being rather intent on a plan which i now broached to him suppose i buy the clothes pegs for half a crown i said and then you take the pegs back again in exchange for a ride in your cart he agreed and together we put the reluctant pony into the shafts and got up in the cart the man had a curious method of driving he did not start the pony by voice or rein in the ordinary way but as soon as we were ready to go he took a stout cudgel and dealt the beast three or four resounding thwacks on the rump the pony moved one ear languidly several more hearty blows descended on various parts of him in quick succession he moved both ears this time and looked round at his master in dull respectful inquiry at the third volley the truth that he was expected to move seemed to dawn on him and he went off willingly enough at a shambling trot i was well into somerset now and so far thoroughly charmed with the county it had none of the tremendous breakneck character of devonshire but was pretty and quiet and wild as a pastoral country could be civilization flowed gently through it but without domination or obtrusiveness the arts of forestry and road-making were in a commendably primitive state the trees seemed to grow how and where it suited them and the highways to wind hither and thither at their own pleasure as much as for the convenience of man at staple fitzpain i sat in the cart while the clothes peg merchant went about his business from door to door it was only a tiny place with a beautiful many pinnacled church tower on which a big glossy starling sat clucking and whistling industriously listening to this queer melody it struck me that there was an aspect of the starling's song 
about which none of our ornithologists appear to have written they all give him credit for being an incorrigible imitator in and out of season but the starling on staple church tower as i lay back on a sackful of gallipots looking up at him against the blue of the morning sky seemed all at once to let me into the secret of this he and his race stood revealed as the victims of a hopelessly mistaken musical ambition he was terribly in earnest yet his ceaseless imitations of the thrushes carolling in the orchards about him were undertaken merely as practice like a hard-working student he was forming his style on the best models and labouring at it with a pathetic fury instead of being happy in the sunshine content to clink his poor triangle in the humble nook of the woodland orchestra to which nature had relegated him he was spoiling life in a fruitless endeavour to become first violin and the worst of it was that he was whelmed in complete self-satisfied ignorance of his artistic plight he sat up on the tar-top high above the most gifted singers plainly confident that he was sustaining an indispensable part in the morning's melody and there i left him still doing his fatuous best smugly unaware like all hopeless incompetents who are also enthusiasts that he moved in the very atmosphere of failure i kept my seat in the jingling little cart until we had exploited another village or two and then as the clothes-peg man was doubling back through the side lanes i parted company with him and journeyed on on foot the road which hitherto had kept mostly to the level now made a sharp ascent through a wood of elms at the summit of the hill the trees abruptly ended and here i came upon a prospect so enchantingly lovely that there was nothing for it but to sit down and leisurely take in its beauties one by one the last trees made an oval frame of greenery for the picture before me i made out now that i had come to the end of the hilly country and that for the rest of the day at least my path would be across the flats on the blue misty earth line the hills began again but between my vantage point and this far off dim sierra there stretched a plain of cultivated land that seemed perfectly level until a cloud shadow strayed over its surface and revealed by its uncertain dipping progress undulations hollows ridges not to be detected in the unleavened brilliance of the sun here and there in this wide-spreading vista were clusters of farm buildings grey church spires pointing to the sky clumps of brown apple wood now and then a glittering thread of river or stream all set in the checkerboard of meadows and fields sweet auburn must be down there i thought if it could be anywhere on earth and my business was to set out and find it without delay i got my camera and rucksack on my back again and was ready to march when a creaking sound came from the road behind me looking round there was a parson pushing a bicycle up the hill he stopped when he reached my corner very much out of breath yet overflowing with geniality it did not look much like a lift a lift i got from him however and one of a kind i never hazarded again we fell into talk while he recovered his breath and i told him of my journey and the means i was using to arrive at its end i had suspected him to be a humorist from his general rubicundity and his little tight glossy curls now his eye gave forth a merry twinkle 
my dear man quoth he why should i be left out of this why shouldn't i too go down to posterity in company with the pantechnican people and the ragman here get up on my step if you have never coasted down a long and steep and rather jolty hill standing on one leg on the step of a bicycle and holding on to a pair of broad clerical shoulders with a camera banging about wildly in your rear you have missed one of the most fearsome joys in creation we charged down the hill like a thunderbolt the wind screaming in our ears luckily there was nothing in our road and we pulled up safely at the bottom as we walked part of the way back together to pick up the parson's hat i put the question to him very mildly i thought under the circumstances what in heaven and earth possessed you to let her go like that why it was that wretched break he explained rather frightened out of his mirthful fit for the nonce i forgot about it until too late but all's well that ends well and now put me in your record for the rest of that morning i wandered through that hale smiling pleasant land picking blackberries as i went and wondering at the prosperity and content of all around me it was evidently a great cider country for the orchards abounded everywhere from the hilltop these had seemed quite brown in colour but a nearer view disclosed this prevailing tint as a blend of the tarnished green of the foliage with the yellow and scarlet of the fruit the white lane took a serpentine course accommodating itself to the features of the landscape it wound about sociably from farm to farm skirted fields dipped down through shady hollows or went off at a tangent to look in at pleasant little villages hiding behind clumps of trees and still autumn seemed as far off as ever some of the tallest of the elms hung out golden banners over their battlements of living green here and there a maple stood up like a crimson torch in the wood or a birch had sparsely decked herself out in amber sequins but as yet there was neither the face of autumn on the landscape nor the touch of it in the vital sun-laden breeze it was in truth november but the land was somerset the summer land of the west all the quiet day through i went trudging on from one sweet shy country nook to another leaving the road whenever the mood beset me taking to the field paths or woodland tracks stopping when i had a mind or strolling on again for no more definite reason than it seemed good to roam or rest i lunched at a place called hatch beauchamp whose inn wide comfortable bright was a materialised invitation to come in and take good cheer and in the deepening light of afternoon i found a solitary cottage tucked away in a roadside quarry pit like a pearl in an oyster through whose open door i beheld an old lady in a sunbonnet sitting at a tea-table laid for two as though she expected me and a shining copper kettle on the fire behind her bubbling me a welcome that was impossible to resist every one i met on that smiling fruitful plain looked happy and contented now and then i was overtaken by some vehicle and found that a single glance at the driver was generally enough to bring him to a stop with a civil invitation to mount and ride but even when going at walking pace it seemed too hurried a progression moreover i had a certain scheme in view it was seldom i looked at my map now 
but in the cottage by the quarry i happened to glance over it and my eye had caught a name kingsbury episcopi it had an alluring old-world ecclesiastic savour just the place one would think to wake up in of a fine sunday morning and this i remembered for the first time now was saturday afternoon i resolved to lie at kingsbury episcopi that night it was but a few miles onward i could reach it in an hour or two at most and as yet the sun was only just tiptoeing the western hills it was deep dusk when i came down the long incline into kingsbury that intense blue dusk which one notices most of all in the fast shortening autumn days there was but one street and that thickly ramparted on either hand with houses of all ages and degrees i passed two inns but somehow though they looked clean and cosy enough i was out of the mood for them i resolved to try for a lodging in one of the cottages if i could prevail upon any of the folk to take me in thereafter to the end of my fifteen days ramble i lay only one other night at a public house and this only for want of better faring it proved always a difficult and delicate business needing much circumspection and not a little diplomacy before my cottage quarters were won for the night at kingsbury i wandered up and down in the darkness for a good half hour inspecting the fronts of the houses or peering in at cottage windows for some token of the sort of people likely to take a stranger in at last i hit upon one of the oldest cottages in the place it was double fronted and thatched with wide low lattice windows through one of which yellow candlelight poured out upon the street i was looking at the cottage turning over in my head how best to further my design when a great strapping fellow in corduroys with a bunch of farm tools on his shoulder came up and lifted the latch of the gate this was my chance i went up to him got into talk asked many questions about kingsbury told him what brought me there and finally broached the matter of a night's lodging saying that it was not my desire to put up at an inn he listened scratching his ear doubtfully well i dunno i couldn't say for sure maybe you'm coom a long way tis true anyways now come in and talk to the missus i followed him to the door and there on the step with the rich glow of fire and candle behind them he and his comely wife and i debated the question at length on every subsequent occasion when i was manoeuvring for cottage hospitality there was always this elaborate doorstep consultation lasting frequently for ten minutes or more and into which in some cases the whole household forces were pressed it was my first attempt of the kind and i sustained my part but ill i did not know then as i afterwards came to realize that this was the crucial time for me and that on my conduct and demeanour during these lengthy minutes by the entry depended the success or failure of my scheme i was on my trial it seemed my appearance voice manner the story i put forward were each in turn subjected to a keen scrutiny and judgment was passed on me according to canons of which on that first essay i was pitiably ignorant on after occasions practice had developed in me the qualities of dove and serpent necessary for the work and i never once failed 
the vital thing is to get an immediate idea of the characteristics of the household these can ordinarily be guessed from the bearing of the people at the door but usually a glance into the room behind them will give you just the password you need in this case i had a view of a comfortable kitchen a meal set out tidily on a spotless table a little cluster of children's fair curly heads about it how many i could not guess and then something that in after days would have guided me infallibly on the true road to favour an open bible throned between the bread platter and a mighty hunk of cheese i say this quite innocently and reverently for then as always my great delight and profit has been to win a way into these little home circles in country england where the faith of the fathers is a daily indispensable thing on this as through all other wanderings in rural england i have tried to discover for myself what the real hold of christianity is in the life of the more humble people and i have come through it all immeasurably reassured and impressed out in the intellectual rough and tumble of city life and the internecine ward in of the churches you may well come by an over gloomy view as to how the larger and only vital issue is perpending but once you get your lungs filled with the home air of the english villagers and your pessimism will arrive at a speedy end it was unfortunate for me that my first venture of this kind should have been hedged about with difficulties greater than fell to my lot on any other occasion and i suppose i owe it more to good luck than anything else that eventually the kingsbury folk decided to take me in they were for lighting a fire in the best parlour and making a lonely gentleman lodger of me but this would never have done i got all my wits to work and called up all resources with the net result that in ten minutes i was given a hearty unreserved place at the common board as a sort of temporary uncle in the midst of the jolliest little circle it is possible to conceive we sat up that night until past eleven o'clock father mother seven children and a very comfortable and happy stranger all gathered round the great crackling hissing wood fire and talking and laughing for the most part all at the same time nothing would induce a single one of them from the oldest to the youngest to forego a moment of that evening and the stranger desired to curtail it least of all but it came to an end at last and i was escorted to my bed in a little triangular room under the thatch full of a fragrance of apples hay and lavender and where i lay awake for hours with the broad somersetshire dialect ringing pleasantly in my head End of chapter 6chapter seven of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain a family breakfast they were early folk in the cottage at kingsbury although it was a sunday morning i awoke to a pleasant clatter of crockery below while yet the light was no more than a grey stain on darkness by the time there was light enough to see the whole house resounded with cheerful voices and it was no later than eight o'clock when we were gathered about the table again ready for the morning meal an amazing transformation had come over the entire family the print pinafores of every day had vanished corduroys had been put away 
father and sons were encased in stiff shiny sunday black and the mother and girls decorously clad in their best frocks each with her hair screwed up in paper bobbins which as i gathered i was by a polite fiction supposed not to see that was a triumphant time for me and at every new token of the unrestrained friendliness and sympathy that had in so short a time grown up between us i felt another feather perking in my cap the great chintz-covered family bible was in its place again and after the reading came prayers and then a rhymed grace intoned by all the children together the whole meal that followed was a succession of surprises as far as i was concerned i had never yet attempted apple pie for breakfast but it went down famously well then there was a bowl of potatoes into which each dipped from time to time with a two-pronged steel fork i felt my miserable insufficiency at this exercise very keenly until i got the knack of it at the outset the coveted potato simply burst into a thousand flowery fragments at the first prod but afterwards i grew more skilful and landed my catch as dexterously as any there followed a course of a sort of hotchpotch ladled by the housewife direct into our plates from the crackling spitting pan on the fire at her side then rounds of homemade bread and dripping and finally coffee in basins with more of the bread broken up in it and weighed down with sinkers of brown sugar it was a memorable feast and one never bettered though often equalled i rejoice to think in many another cottage welcome i came by on my journey through the five shires but all these good times ended in an awkward though inevitable moment at an inn you can ask for your score and it will be only a matter of business the money changes hands and the thing is done with there and then no one being in the least discomposed but to broach the question of payment to these hearty unimaginably sensitive folk in the midst of such real kindness and goodwill is a task for which you must set your teeth and call up all your hardihood i had to do it many times throughout my long ramble and eventually developed a strategy which i believe caused a minimum of heart-burning to all the plan was to get the farewells and handshakings over inside the house with all but the wife and then to lure her by some means alone to the door whereupon all elaborate palaver and diplomacy was dropped the question put as casually as possible and another and pleasanter subject immediately pounced upon directly the hateful business was through i managed it fairly well that morning but took a red face off with me that lasted the best part of a mile out of doors i found myself moving in a very different atmosphere from that of the farm labourer's cottage it was a misty raw silent morning with a settled gloom overhead like an abiding remnant of the night kingsbury did not improve on a daylight acquaintance not a soul stirred in the length of the street and there was a dour sabbatarian influence abroad reminding one of a damp cathedral crypt moreover as i now discovered when i was clear of it the place lay on the brink of a flat poor country little better than marshland in fact the road on either hand was bordered with pollard willows and these despondent-looking vegetables stretched away before me in a melancholy double row as far as the eye could penetrate the mist 
running water drummed in the deep dikes that intersected all the fields plovers wailed disconsolately over my head coming and going through the white miasma of the morning like the ill-omened fowls they have always seemed to me for the first time since the beginning of my travels i felt lonely an unbefriended homeless wanderer in a forsaken land i tramped i suppose a good four miles under these depressing conditions and then pulled up to consider my case for all the difference there was in the scene about me i might just as well have stopped where i had begun an hour before the same stolid drumstick-headed trees lined away before and behind the same cows lay chewing the cud in the same flat green pastures the same peewits were tumbling and keening weirdly overhead in a denser fog than ever and now the finishing touch was put to the picture one by one from different far-off stations in the vacuous heaven church bells began a mournful measured muffled requiem the sound crept about in the dumb blind morning as though the bells themselves had taken wing and like the peewits were hovering restlessly to and fro at once my courage went down like a stone i thought of all the crimes i had committed all the widows and orphans i had persecuted all the guileless trusts i had betrayed the notion seized me that i was an escaped prisoner hiding like pip's convict on the marshes and waiting for a file and whittles i even fancied i heard the warning guns from the hulks dully bursting the mist a mile away and just to see how it felt took to hugging myself and limping to and fro whether it was another instance of nature's moods communicating themselves irresistibly to the human heart or whether it was rather to be ascribed to the apple pie and potatoes i found myself wallowing in a quagmire of despondency unlike anything i had ever experienced before i pushed on through the sodden shrouded landscape gradually all the bells but one slackened and stopped but this one kept tolling and as i walked grew louder and took on an earnest persuasive tone somehow i conceived the notion that this bell had spied me out from its lofty perch and was calling to me over the grey waste of marshes to come and see how cosy and warm the church was how comfortably dry the seats and the doctrine there and how i could sit near the door and creep out before the collection if i chose it was not an exalted frame of mind in which to attend a place of worship but i argued any mind was better than none at all so i shook off my sombre mood and set my steps briskly in the direction from which the sound came the steady chime soon grew nearer and clearer shadowy cottages began to appear on either side of the way at every few yards now i overhauled little knots of people in their sunday best all straggling in the same direction at last i found myself one in a crowded procession hurrying up a stone flagged church path with the last clang of the bell vibrating away into silence in the invisible turret overhead i left my impedimenta in the porch among the spare surplices and stole into the nearest vacant seat i will arise and go to my father and will say unto him father i have sinned against heaven and before thee 
and am no more worthy to be called thy son through the rustle of prayer-book leaves the words drifted down to me in my nook behind the last great fluted stone pillar and i thought i had never heard a richer nor a wearier voice i craned my neck for a view of the minister though candles were lighted here and there the little church was so dim that at first i could make out nothing distinctly but after a minute or two i traced the voice to its origin behind the chancel screen where in the glimmer of a hanging circle of the same primitive lights i saw a white-haired old man wearing the oxford scarlet and stooping feebly over his book beyond him the choir lined up at some plain low desks and beyond these again there were more candles breaking the dusk of the poorly furnished sanctuary the whole church was inexpressibly bare and full of a dusty mouldy dejection over the altar there were a few bits of stained glass set oddly askew in the blank green checkers of the window and giving out a gem-like lustre even against that overmastering gloom but all the other windows were destitute of ornament what little of the raw one morning could filter through showed me only rough-hewn walls and columns soaring up into the darkness of the black oak roof the place might have been a cave cut out lovingly enough yet in mortal haste and fear from the solid rock by hands gone to dust two thousand years ago you would have as soon look for them in a catacomb as expect to find joy and hope making this their perennial nesting place from the tarnished cross faintly giving back the candle shine in the poor sanctuary to the heap of worm-eaten funeral lumber by the west door there was hardly a material thing to aid and urge the spirit and forthwith i felt my heart going up like a lark into a summer sky it has been my great good fortune to meet with other men such as this but none who carried on such frail bowed shoulders so easily and so gladly the whole burden of a whole parish full of savable souls the church was packed with people the roughest of carters and farm labourers hip and shoulder with their well-to-do masters and their gaily caparisoned wives i had not been among them five minutes before i knew that one and all doted on the white-haired rugged-faced patriarch who tottered so capably before them in the fight a hundred little things told me that it was a poor parish in a poor land with a poor parson bravely eking out its resources in heart and pocket to their utmost the whole service went with a swing and verve delightful to behold there was not a sour face from one end of the church to the other and for all i could tell the choir might have been performing merely in dumb show so completely was their music lost in the uproar of the congregation and then when the sermon began another and a pleasanter surprise was in store for me in silence so profound that you could hear the bustle of the sparrows in the ivy outside the two-foot thick wall the old man gave out the simple text whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do ye even so to them then closing his book taking off his spectacles and leaning over the pulpit towards his people in hearty affectionate familiarity he told them that others meant the whole world that in all they did 
from the simplest act to the most momentous they were never to forget that they were not carrying through some private matter of their own but were really engaged in an integral part of the great work of the father either forwarding it or retarding it just as the act was good or bad then he took them through their common working day from one simple almost trivial incident to another showing the right and the wrong of each and dwelling on the truth that all acts of obedience were of equal value in the eye of god whether it were but checking a microscopic lie or burning at the martyr's stake not once did he speak of sin disobedience was always his name for it from beginning to end there was not a word about creed or was of conduct christianity was not a creed but a life he cried sending his old quavering voice ringing to the rafters we on earth from the archbishop to the humblest layman were all common soldiers in the fight we had neither time nor heads for the science of strategy the common soldier took his uniform his weapons his orders on implicit trust leaving all to his general but the hard knocks and the weary marching and we must do the same in whatever regiment of the great army our names were enrolled it was rank undenominationalism but no one seemed a penny the worse for it and we all trooped out of the little ivy-smothered block of a church humming joyfully like a swarm of bees and ready for another week's grubbing in those penurious acres out on the road again the mist had cleared somewhat and i could now distinguish a little of the country round me there was a signpost at a turning not far ahead and coming to this i read to ilchester three miles to ilchester therefore i resolved to go the fog was lifting bodily and with every step now i got a more widely extended view at last i could see to the horizon although the sky still remained densely obscured and the light almost as grey as ever i made out a far-off jumble of housetops and quickening my pace got into ilchester just as the inns were opening their doors there was the cow and the bull and a little red tavern whose name now evades me i picked out the one with the green shutters and the bull's-eye glass to its windows and soon found myself one of a select parlour company presided over by a landlord who was the very apotheosis of genial content every one in the room showed the same marked tendency and afterwards when i was taking a survey of the place i met and spoke with hardly a single one who did not turn me a designedly beaming face obviously all the inhabitants of ilchester were deep in a conspiracy of cheerfulness and from what i came to see and know of the place i judged it to be as great a necessity in their daily lives as meat and drink when i formed my opinion of it the sun was breaking through a grey dilapidation of sky and tinging everything with its golden hue how it felt to be there under less inspiriting conditions i could only dimly imagine ilchester had an undeniably stony stare an innate solitariness a stagnation in marked contrast to the bearing of the people the tide of active life appeared to have receded from it ages ago and to have left it stranded in weedy mossy oblivion merged in such a quietude 
as weighed down the very lids of your eyes and what an evil legacy of reputation dwells upon the place and must ever cling to it there in the heart of the main street stand the ruins of the old hanging prison every mouldering stone crying out with a separate voice to the passer-by the hardened native may long ago have schooled himself into indifference about it but the stranger wears none of this protective armour he recoils with something like terror from the sight of those great gates miserable stern soul swallowers idling fatly in the sun what remain of the walls still breathe out the old stupid strength and chartered pitilessness of their days of activity the ruined chapel with its narrow oddly cruciform windows must have been built of malice aforethought as like to the prison house itself as decency could well go year by year nature is doing her best by dint of rain and sun and winged seed to smother out this foul thing in unimagined wantoning beauty of grass and wild flower lichen and moss but that the ilchester folk should go on from decade to decade placidly tolerating the thing in their midst that there should be any capable pair of hands there that does not ache to join in the instant work of its obliteration strikes the casual visitor with nothing less than amazement if ever there were a need for a cheerful busy centre of life it is here where ilchester stands a packed sociability of houses and human concentration a busy stir and medley of traffic and voices would prove a blessing to hundreds of poor folk who might escape to it for a while from those dismal westward flats but even if the place were all this and more that ghastly torso of the prison must spoil all pleasure for any one who has not been born into indifference for it or has not resolutely lived it down i made haste to get a good stretch of clean honest ground between me and this disgustingly affable little settlement and was soon climbing up the farther hill in the pale misty sunshine wondering at the change that had come over the lay of the land End of chapter seven Chapter Eight of Lift Luck on Southern Roads by Tigner Edwards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sunday afternoon. For every step throughout the rest of that day took me into a finer, fairer country. It was a typical Sunday afternoon, calm and drowsy, temperate in everything a season of placid half-moods the lane wound between broad green verges dotted over with a wealth of flowers in the hedgerows clustered berries of briar hawthorn bryony hung out their scarlet in the warm sun beyond these multitudes of sheep lay about in the pastures happy old horses looked over at me thoughtfully as i went by and contented cows hobnobbed together in the shade of the trees and all were more than half asleep even the signposts seemed to droop their arms languidly as though they too considered themselves off duty when none but a single solitary wayfarer was stirring in the whole lazy length and breadth of the land that was a memorable a profitable afternoon for all its uneventfulness i went along by the hour together pipe in mouth hands thrust deep into pockets eyes roving luxuriously from one point of beauty to another 
after a while i took to plucking a nosegay from the abundance of late blossom around me just to see how many different kinds i could get with a little occasional hedge-breaking unlimited trespass and one or two long rambling explorations down side lanes i got together a magnificent posy an armful of rich colour wherein there were no two flowers alike here is the list a brave one for november calamint bellflower buttercup plume thistle spear thistle mallow cranesbill wild sage harebell hawkweed sheepspit knapweed white archangel red archangel blackberry st john's wort nipplewort silverweed brassica dandelion heather chervil marjoram honeysuckle ragwort white campion red campion sow thistle red clover white clover yarrow hogweed lily bind yellow trefoil meadowsweet mayweed dropwort teasel poppy veronica daisy borage groundsel strawberry hemp agrimony forty-five different kinds of wild flowers and all fine full-grown specimens nothing seemed to do hardily in that rich lush somerset land the hours went by and the light deepened as the sun drew down into the west my shadow stretched out longer and longer before me and then just when i thought myself miles away from any inhabited quarter a church clock struck startlingly near and clear i counted its four slow beats as i breasted the top of the hill and found myself looking down on the very ideal of an english village a mile or more sheer under my feet there was a seat hard by and a sleepy man lounging at full length upon it i roused him to ask the name of the place camel said he and returned at once to his land of dreams i thought i had misheard him and asked again this time he did not trouble to open his eyes but he moved his legs to give me room to sit down if i willed camel queen's camel thisn did never ye hear o the camels afore it was four o'clock and tea-time somewhere down in that quietly populous valley there was a kettle a copper one i hoped whose destiny it was to brew the cup for me if ever i felt like hastening prospect into actuality it was on that hot glamorous thirsty afternoon and yet i lingered on that eagle eyrie of a hilltop a good half hour immovable fascinated at the bit of picture poetry spread out at my feet the eye rested first on the tall square church tower amazingly tall it looked and indeed proved then you noticed how compact the village was a ruddy grey oval of tiled roofs and red chimney tops from each of which extended a violet plume of smoke the plumes all drifting one way on the gentle sunset breeze everywhere within and about it great elm trees stood up in the amber light you caught a glimpse here and there of the white curve of a street a shining weather vane the bright reflection of windows water rippling and gleaming under an old stone bridge but most of all the voice of the place held you it stole up through the sun-tinctured air in one dim mirthful flood of sound human voices the voice of the river the voice of the organ in the old church the baying voices of hounds 
a hundred indistinguishable echoes of life joined to make up that quiet imponderable symphony but not a stroke or wheel rumble of the working day it was the very voice of the sabbath that came creeping hovering up to you on that sun-crowned hill i got to my feet at last and lowered myself gently step by step down the precipitous way making out continual fresh beauties as i went by and by i drew into the charmed circle of the place took rank among the strolling sunday comradeships landed finally on the flagstones of the church path and began to look about me lazily for any sign of tea the streets were fast emptying of their casual company every one was going home on the same quest disappearing into doors and garden gates singly or in chattering twos and threes after a while i seemed to be left alone in the world the only one of the throng compelled to stay out of doors i wandered to and fro on the empty pavements the church clock struck five and seemed to look down on me with rather contemptuous pity at last as i was turning back designing to knock up the folk at the inn i caught sight of a little whitewashed house standing deep amidst red and yellow chrysanthemums with an old gentleman on a chair in the porch placidly enjoying a pipe as i ventured up his trim brick path between the gay rows of blossom considering how best to deal with him the old gentleman looked at me over his spectacles first with grave inquiry and then with a thoroughly hearty welcoming smile i knowed as some un'd be along afore sundown said he triumphantly as he knocked out his pipe and rose with some difficulty to his slippered feet tis seldom as sunday goes we're out some un or other i tell ye well i'll talk it o'er wi ye and welcome whoever ye be come in sir come right in this was a perfectly astonishing reception the speech i was so carefully preparing for him vanished from my mind i could make nothing of the situation as yet but plainly i was on the brink of one of those mild adventures which so often and so unexpectedly cropped up throughout my journey setting therefore an instant guard on my tongue for fear of prematurely spoiling the matter i followed the old gentleman in it was a queer little parlour there was the copper kettle sure enough in a frantic state of ebullition on the fire an old cat dozed on a hassock beneath a table was laid for tea with the inevitable somerset apple pie in the middle but what most attracted my attention was the decoration of the walls instead of the usual framed lithographs and family portraits there was a round dozen of extraordinary maps or diagrams home drawn and violently coloured maps of the world principally with the names of the countries curiously misspelled my eye caught great britain france hammerica africa hinga at a single sweep while outside the gaudy circles were freehand drawings of a most puzzling character one represented a coach and four being hurled into space another showed a bucket of water tipping over a third a ship upside down falling out of an inverted sea the largest and gaudiest of the maps was surrounded with drawings of human beings of all nationalities at the top of the world these folk were shown walking at their ease but elsewhere 
they were in the wildest confusion either clinging with hands and feet to hilltops and trees or being precipitated in whole scrambling batches into space the outer universe being symbolized by an infinity of yellow stars on a field of ultramarine the old gentleman left me to examine these wonders in silence while he bustled about preparing tea he seemed to take it so absolutely for granted that i was to join him in his meal that he never even went through the form of inviting me my gals is out visitin he explained they won't be home for an hour or more but we'll make out purty well without em now not a word of that there waving his hand at the walls till we've done and cleared we got on famously together he turned the talk at once on education and i soon found that he took me for a schoolmaster he was eloquent as to bringens up of which it was soon obvious he himself had had but little by the time the meal was finished he had got round from education in general to one particular branch of it and then the whole mystery of the diagrams was suddenly revealed the scholards is all wrong about the world he began as soon as he had cleared the table tis a round ball they say round ball why tis naught but madness as i'll soon prove to ye he reached down one of the maps now looky here if the world as us lives on was a round ball what ud happen why us ud all fall off wouldn't us like these yere figures up atop there us wouldn't come to no harm plain enough but how about hostrally down under gosh i ha no patience wi it he had already worked himself up into a red heat but held to his attitude of scientific calm bravely through it all and what about the sea he went on water ain't like paint or plaster as ye can stick on the ceiling and there abides water wants holdin up by summat this year bucket now tis full up and keeps full here and camel but if so be as the world was a round ball and hostrally was down there under your feet and you was to take the bucket to hostrally what ud happen why the water ud come pourin out double quick i tell ee he paused a moment for breath then plunged again into his subject tis jest like that with the sea we knows a ship sails on the sea when tis right side hubbard but look at this yere picture that shows what manner a mess ye'd be in wi your round balls why every drop o salt water and every ship ud be gone to smitheriks along afore gorra mighty ud a time to make adam let alone heave tis all rank starin foolishness he was feeling about in his pockets absent-mindedly then catching sight of his pipe on the mantel-shelf seized and lighted it but this year see says you a goes all round the world and ships goes too as every one knows because cap and cook a sailed off down one way and come up t'other side likewise says you there be thousands as seen full buckets o water in hostrally ay granted and now us comes to the truth o the whole durn matter he reached down another of the world maps and laid it on the table then he produced a boxful of what i took to be children's toys miniature houses ships trees and the like carved out of wood and painted and which he arranged upon the huge circle of the map now here it all be 
he said in triumph there be the world flat and round like a plate not round always like your round ball no bother or north and now the ships they bides in the sea and the water in the bucket and the folk on their feet as god intended em never matter whether tis queen's camel or cockamaroo ay tis all clear as clear to a thinkin man but what i ventured to ask happened to captain cook if he sailed over the edge of a plate and up the other side instead of round a ball he must have been in just as much danger of falling off in one case as the other ha the old gentleman uttered a shout of delight why don't you understand and you a schoolmaster why i went round on the edge of the plate and kept right side up all the time i thought i were goin straight ahead but i weren't i went crooked unbeknownst tis the electricity in the hair as does it i reckons he added many more details of his theory as ingenious as the rest the recital of which lasted him until we had reached the garden gate there he gave me a final grip of the hand teach they boys the truth on't he said earnestly never no harm comes out o knowin truth but there's one thing as worrits me terrible these year coal mines they keeps on a diggin and a diggin down they goes deeper and deeper every year now what will happen think ye when they gets through why i be afeard as all the sea'll run away and there'll be naught but dry land and that'll be the end of the world for sure don't ye mind what is writ in the good book and there shall be no more sea i left him then standing with rapt awestruck face his pipe raised dramatically over his head and when i looked back from the end of the street he was still at the gate leaning over it now and pondering deeply that first sunday and fourth day of my ramble finished with a six-mile ride in a milk cart to wincanton under the light of the serene autumn moon i arrived in the quaint precipitous little town just as the churches were overflowing into the streets and getting into talk with a friendly postman i was soon lucky enough by aid of the now familiar formulae to land myself in comfortable private lodgings for the night End of chapter eight chapter nine of lift luck on southern roads by tickner edwards this librivox recording is in the public domain the charm of wincanton it was tuesday morning before i left wincanton my design had been to push on somewhere or other with every day and i had indeed made the usual start eastward on monday but loitering about the narrow steep alleys of the old place enjoying its placidity its grey mediaevalism in the crisp sparkling sunlight the minutes had drawn out imperceptibly to hours and nightfall had found me still there less inclined than ever to turn my back upon it to me the charm of wincanton lay in its stately self-sufficiency and its manifest indifference to whatever strangers might happen to be within its gates thriving well to do even go ahead in a certain old-fashioned unobtrusive style it was yet plain enough that the twentieth century had made little mark on it the place still held staunchly to old times still cherished the national hatred of guy fawkes still went about its business in the ancient hearty country way civil to strangers 
yet caring little either for their presence or their bounty i found myself free in the truest sense to wander about unobserved and unmolested to get into brown studies at odd street corners and generally to play the note-taking chill to my heart's content it is outside the purpose of an itinerary so wilfully unconventional as this to deal with the towns chanced upon in the journey and i must leave wincanton with just this brief word but i came upon one little gem which was well worth resetting it was a signboard on a tiny house in one of the most secluded corners of the queer zigzag old place and i give it with all its perfections on its head alfred jordan chimney sweep and fire defender do live here i contend your orders and charge not too dear with brush and scraper and machine i do my work both neat and clean if your smoke jacks are the worse for wear send to me and i will put them in repair patronized by royalty the weather had changed while i tarried in wincanton the wind had gone round to the cold quarter and the air bit with a surprising sharpness on my face as i climbed the eastern hill out of the town though the sunshine poured from a cloudless blue sky every shadow was white with frost in a single night winter had driven her keen lance right into the heart of the smiling elderly season as soon as i was clear of the town i chose a sunny corner in the hedgerow where there was a convenient block of stone to sit on and got out my maps i learned with something like a start that i had travelled right through the southern part of somerset and that the wiltshire boundary was only three or four miles away the rapid progress i had made perturbed me greatly i saw that i had been suffering from the dread modern ailment speed fever without knowing it and from that time forward i registered a vow and faithfully kept to it that i would accept a lift in nothing that went above walking pace with this commendable resolve fresh upon me i now became aware of a very low and distant rumbling as of thunder in the air there was a robin just over my head singing so energetically that at first i thought i was mistaken in the sound but it gradually gained in strength and at last i guessed its meaning it must be a traction engine lumbering up the hill from the town presently a sooty man turned the corner of the road trudging along with a rolled-up red flag tucked away under his arm and then the great grinding clanging monster hove into view breathing forth smoke and sparks against the blue of the morning and towing behind it a whole trainload of agricultural gear there was a threshing machine like a mammoth noah's ark next to the engine behind this came the travelling way rearing its giant skeleton arm into the tree-tops and scraping off whole sackfuls of leaves as it went then followed a big black box on wheels with windows and a chimney to it which was house and home to the men of the threshing gang finally came the water cart astride of which sat three or four of the company contentedly smoking their pipes in the cheery sunshine and cracking jokes as they went i took stock of the engine driver as he approached and liked the build of him he had merry blue eyes set deep in a clever soot begrimed face he smoked a briar pipe with a straight stem which is always a sign of the companionable disposition crooked pipe men are ordinarily reserved 
or at least diffident and inclined to regulate conduct by second thoughts a fatal habit in chance camaraderie but this one had no curve pipe hesitation about him it was useless to shout in such a din all i could do was to sign to him that i wanted to take passage in his thundering argosy he flashed me a grin that showed a splendid double row of white teeth the next moment i had gripped his outstretched coal-black hand and had been hauled up into the cab of the engine landing into the arms of both driver and stoker rather flustered and very much out of breath looking back now on that morning's ride i am inclined to rank it among the serenest most placidly enjoyable of all my lift experiences a sack was spread on the coal bunker and i was hoisted up on to it out of the way connected talk with my fellow travellers was impossible we could do no more than exchange polite shouts at intervals and as both driver and stoker were busy enough with the management of the engine and were forced to keep their backs turned to me nearly all the time we soon gave up this vociferous exercise thenceforward i sat on the coals looking about me studying the working of the engine and quaking like a jelly from top to toe i have said that the experience was a serenely enjoyable one and this is by no means so paradoxical as it looks i was in a vortex of deafening sound my eyes vibrated in their sockets i sat open-mouthed because only in this way could my teeth be dissuaded from mutual destruction but the steady rhythmic throb of the machinery had a strangely ordering and composing element about it in a little while the chaos resolved itself into its true parts once i had got the key to all its necessary uproar and vehemence my mind settled down to a tranquil enjoyment of the situation the watch in my pocket could go about its lilliputian work of time measuring on silken tiptoe and at a whisper but thunderstorms and faith and traction engines are built on a vaster plan if ever faith succeeds in moving the mountain all the world will need to stop its ears we kept the main road for about three miles and then slowed down to execute a difficult manoeuvre this was to turn into a lane almost at right angles to our previous course i have watched pilots take great ocean-going steamers through intricate soundings and into narrow dock gates but never saw such anxious self-reliant skill as our engineer displayed when he coaxed his long train round that corner there were trees to dodge a signpost to avoid deep ditches flanking both roads to be kept out of a few inches miscalculation in the angle of approach would have meant disaster or at least a tedious dismemberment of the whole train and perhaps long delay for with such a load backing is well nigh impossible but at the first try we struck the right curve to a hair's breadth slowly the engine dragged its ponderous tail after it a shower of leaves came eddying down as the long arm of the travelling way ripped through the branches overhead the water cart got its wheel on the bank lurched dangerously but righted again slowly and surely the train straightened itself and with something very like a snort of mingled triumph and relief the engine lunged forward once more on a free throttle and began pounding up the farther hill i had read the name on the signpost as we passed it was pencil wood 
and penzlewood was as good as any other place for me so long as it lay in the back country that i loved whither the threshing gang was bound i had not troubled to inquire asking questions was such a throat-splitting business but our destination proved not far ahead in half an hour or so we came abreast of a farmhouse standing in a little township of cornricks and drew to a halt the sudden silence and stillness that now enveloped me was almost terrifying i felt as if the world itself had stopped dead in mid-space and the next thing would be the last trump call and the immediate dissolution of all things i climbed down from the cab of the engine like a man in a dream but finding myself a prey to pins and needles in both feet and a decided grogginess in all other members i became assured of the normality of my surroundings and stamped myself back into the wingless mundane wanderer again the engineer was standing close by cleaning his hands on a bundle of cotton waste we are going in here he said and as we shall stop three or four days you will hardly care to wait for us i looked at him astounded the voice was the voice of a gentleman and now as he threw open the coat of his greasy blue jean slops he displayed a gold watch chain and a suit of clothes that would have passed muster on brighton parade he guessed the reason of my blank look and laughed to himself quietly oh yes he said we can't trust the ordinary mechanic to bring out the tackle to these out-of-the-way farms it needs great care as you have seen my father is the largest engine owner for miles round and there are four of his sons all driving somewhere or other to-day we are a pretty hard-working family when he had removed as much of the grease from his hands as would come off he gave me a wincing farewell grip and turned busily to the work awaiting him i watched the whole reverberating procession of juggernauts until it disappeared round the corner of the farm then took the road eastward a solitary tramp again there is an old belief upborne by nature poets and prosers alike that the year passes from one season to another by infinite degrees summer is but the completed spring autumn only a gradual surrender and winter the negation of life cometh through endless imperceptible backslidings but the fallacy of this idea must soon be evident to any one living much out of doors throughout the year the truth is that with most years there is a very real and sharp demarcation between one season and another nature chooses her day sometimes her hour when the change is brought about and for each change she has her token it is the apple bloom with which she signs away the youth of spring you may go to bed taking a last look at it swaying beneath your window in the moonlight breeze like snow caught and upheld in mid-air by invisible gambolling fairies and you may well link the earth in your dreams with an eternal juvenility but to-morrow summer new-born as is his wont to his full free stature may be astride the world and all a blossom blenched and falling it is the same with summer itself a year comes sometimes when the change is so deliberate that it can be followed almost leaf by leaf when you can go abroad the book of the old play in your hands and check off one by one each dwindling word of the finale 
but most often summer dies like a shot bird the one moment a soaring miracle of colour and life the next a draggled dead thing in the grass with the hectic of decay already bright upon it i had left the far devon coast autumn winning all along the red cliff line had caught up the summer again in the slow-going sheltered inland valleys and now ever drawing away from the temperate land of the west i found myself once more in the midst of a new country and a new season as i went along the tree-locked lanes red leaves spangled the path before me a rain of them fell about my ears with every touch of the urging wind thousands more were getting ready above to let go their year-long anchorage gold from the elms russet red from the beeches pale umber from the oaks all lay squandered on the path ahead or filled the sunbeams with flecks of glancing twirling colour i looked for nature's sign of the changed times and soon found it the ash that ventures last of all the forest trees into timorous furtive leaf is always the first to abjure its lightly held summer convictions it gives us no transitional hues with it there is none of the picturesque obsequies the dying in golden purple of its deciduous brethren but at the first sharp nip of the frost it casts its whole panoply of green sprays ingloriously to earth and is already abjectly naked to the breeze while yet oak and elm and beech have hardly surrendered a single ingot of their glory there is a certain philosopher who teaches that not man alone but all living creation possesses the germ of immortal soul the midget whose span of earthly life is but an hour's dance in the sunshine the tortoise who dozes a century the dog we loved and the horse that carried us the flower in the crannied wall and the mighty oak hail still under the weight of hundreds of years all have their hereafter of more airy dancing or willing service or state of use and beauty well if this be so with what face will the ash draw nigh to the gate of the eternal garden you can be sure of the hazel for it hung out its green catkins bravely in the chill of the february day and the little colt's foot for it coloured the banks long before any other flower dared show a petal and the oak for it held up against a thousand winter storms but what of the ash that would not trust the sunshine with a single leaf until april was done and that cried craven with the earliest passing chill of november i left the brittle-minded graceless thing standing naked and unashamed in the midst of its discarded finery and trudged on over the ever thickening carpet of the lane End of chapter nine